when I meet Matt, probably five years ago, um, for for twenty years I've been involved in uh, professional wrestling, kind of in one form or, no, or the other. Uh, but Matt worked for a local TV station, and the TV station uh, promoted a wrestling federation. And we were at uh, one of the big high schools, and uh, I heard this guy announcing out, the ring announcer, and he's had this deep voice, and I was like, that don't even sound like the people that's been announcing it. I go and look out the curtain, I'm trying to see this guy, and here's this hawk of a human in a, a jacket and a turtleneck, and he's just wiring that microphone out. I mean, he was just using it like a weapon. Ladies and gentlemen. I mean, just very professional. And quick as he came backstage, I was like, you're not from around here, are you? And and we just struck up a, a friendship because he, he seemed very professional. And every time we had wrestling, we'd get to talking. And he mentioned that, well, he, he, he had worked a little in movies. And he said... Uh, Asked me had I saw, saw the movie Mosquito, and I so happened I had saw it just a few weeks before, and uh, he was telling me that he'd worked on that movie, and one thing led to another, and he's like, uh, maybe we could get together and work on a movie, and uh, of course that that was a dream come true to me because from being in uh, being a professional magician, professional wrestling, it, it's just performing. And of course, Matt, or, uh, making movies, being in a movie, was just on up that ladder. And uh, why, yes. Oh, I agreed to that in a heartbeat. And uh, we we almost had one in production. And just due to a lot of bad luck, we lost our funding. And he said, if we ever get, get things straightened up, he said, we will make a movie. It probably went three years, three or four years, and we would meet every month or two and just chit-chat and talk. And I was on vacation in Florida, and my son called, and he said, do you remember Matt Hunley? And I'm like, sure. He said, he called and said he's got a movie deal going, wants you to work on it and be in it. And I'm like, certainly. Quick as we got back from vacation, I called Matt, and the wheel started rolling. And that was in September of 06. And March of 07, we started shooting The Whisperer in Darkness. And it was a roller coaster. On and off, we've worked for several months on it, but the actual filming didn't only took several weeks. But um, one of, one of the most exciting things I've I've ever dealt with. Um, it, of course, it's low budget. Um, I just can't even imagine. They talk about movies that's. Thirty million dollars. I, I just can't even imagine that. Um, me and Matt mustered money together, and we've got just a touch over seven hundred dollars in this movie. Uh, but now, don't let that figure fool you, because it's a good movie. Just if you're watching this, you've probably seen it. And I hope you agree, uh, because. When I first got involved in magic some 25 years ago, uh, I live in a small town, and you just didn't go across the street to a magic shop and buy magic, so I just had to get what books I could find and had to make do. I'd make stuff, and it seemed like all my life we, we made do. Uh, even when I was young, uh, my father, he was just very handy, uh, making stuff and we always just made do with what we had and made stuff and I growed up the same way and and I instilled that in my boys you you make do you make what you need 
uh, and, and just work around what you can't get. And that fits in so well with low-budget filmmaking. And, and, and it surprised me, uh, Matt's going to college, and I just really thought, yeah, this college boy, the guy can whip up stuff and he'd drag his stuff out. Look what I made. And I would just be amazed. Uh, I, I just had him so kind of figured wrong because, uh, but he's very, he's just like me. We made, we made or borrowed everything that was in the movie. Uh, you, you will see the little, um, cylinder record player type deal it plays the little cylinder that uh uh albert is is fooling with matt made that there's no way we could we could have bought one we we could have bought one we couldn't have paid for one so matt makes one and it's it looks so authentic and it worked it would it would work of course it didn't play but it it suited its purpose quite well and just different things. Um, everything that we... I, I just don't mean to just keep beating that horse, but uh, uh, it was just a lot of it was just luck. Uh, things that uh, we just... It was like, well, we really need this. And I'd call Matt up. Hey, Matt, who's the man? He's like, uh... You're the man. I was like, you're right. I found a 1930 Ford car we can use. And it's just, everything just worked out perfectly like that. Uh, lots of real good folks in a small town that, that you can depend on. Uh, no one thought that we were trying to take advantage of anybody. We told them we were trying to make a movie. First movie ever made in this region. And everybody was, was on board. And uh, we, we touch more on that in the uh, commentary track. Uh, we name some names and just tell how nice the people was. And, and again, you know, I just hate to keep on pulling that chain, but uh, people was just very nice. I, I would just go into people's stores and, um, could I borrow so-and-so? We're, we're making a movie. Making a movie. Sure. And, and they'd loan it to us. And what can I say? I mean, I... I cleaned my mother's house out of antiques, lamps and jars and stuff like that, and, she, and books. She was just like, oh, sure. But, you know, after years of me being in magic and wrestling, she, it, it didn't surprise her any. You know, oh, sure, go ahead. You're making a movie. Sure, what's, what's next? But, uh, yeah, it, it's been real interesting. Uh, yeah, it was probably... Uh, about five years ago that I met Mike, um, I was working at a local TV station and um, the television station, they sponsored a, a local wrestling federation. And uh, I guess that night I was there shooting, uh, running a camera that night and some uh, emergency came up and the normal announcer actually wasn't able to show up. And uh, the show has to go on, <laughs> as they say. And uh, the guy that owns the station, he said, hey, Matt, you got a good voice. Why don't you go out there and try it? And I had never, you know, I'd, I've been on stage a few times. I've done a few minor things here and there, but I've never really performed in front of people. Uh, but I, I'm pretty comfortable in front of people, so I should, sure, why not? And, you know, that way I didn't have to, uh, you know, lug that heavy camera around all night. So I said, sure, give me the microphone. I'll take a stab at it. And uh, I went out there and, um, you know, I just mimicked what I had heard up to that point, as far as, you know, I mean, when you're a kid, you watch wrestling and stuff. Everybody does. Um, so I just mimicked that, and um, everybody seemed to like it. And um, I remember the first night I was there, uh, you know, I'm ladies and gentlemen doing all that stuff. And uh, then this one guy comes out. He's, I don't know, four or five inches taller than everybody. Black suit, dark glasses, hair grease. He's a real sinister-looking guy. And he just had a presence to him that, you know... I mean, everybody that was there, they're professionals, but this guy, he just, you know, I, so I thought, you know, I got to go talk to this guy. And um, I just went up and introduced myself to him. And uh, he's a real nice guy. Turned out to be Mike Sexton. And um, we talked uh, a little bit, and he liked horror movies. I liked horror movies. We liked a lot of the same things. Um, you know, he invited me over to his house. I had dinner with him. Uh, uh, 
you know, we just struck up quite a friendship right off the bat. We, it would go, you know, we'd have a wrestling show, and I'd, I'd talk to him. I'd, I'd meet him there, and we'd talk, and uh, it'd be a month or two, and, you know, the next show would come up, and he'd be there. And, and uh, I don't know, it was three or four shows that I found out that he actually lived real close, and we swapped phone numbers and said, yeah, 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 someday, man, we'll have to get together, and we'll have to get this. And, and um, you know, usually when you meet somebody, I know when I meet someone, um I can tell if they have that that spark that I call it. Um, you just know I do when I meet somebody if they can do it or not. You know, I know whether they can act, whether they can pull it off. Um, and and Mike, he just had that spark, man. And and I was real interested in getting a movie together. And uh, I I just asked him, I was like, hey, man, uh, would you be interested in in working on a low budget movie? And he said, absolutely, you know, you just, just tell me when and where and I'll be there. Uh, and we, we started getting a project together and uh, it just sort of fell apart like a lot of low budget productions do. And I told him that, uh, you know, Mike, I tell you, man, if I ever get anything going, I will call you. And, well, you know, I mean, we were, you know, we're pretty good pals up to that point, but he probably thought I was just, you know kind of shining him on that oh yeah if anything ever happens i'll call you but but really uh after that um, we started getting a movie together um originally started a production with the polonia brothers and uh that sort of fell apart and um i wound up kind of holding a bag on the production and i knew mike was into it and i uh i called him and i said you know hey mike uh you know one half of this deal kind of fell apart i need somebody else to kind of you know, pick up the slack and carry this project with me. Would you be interested in, in coming in and actually, you know, being my partner on this thing? And again, he was just absolutely, man. You say when and where, and I'll be there. And that's pretty much been Mike along the whole project, man. When and where, he's there. Um, it turned out to be real beneficial because Mike's, I mean, he's more than just an actor. He wound up doing a it says co-producer in the credits, but Mike pretty much produced the movie, man. I mean, I could call him up and uh, ask him for anything, and within a few days, he'd have it. You know, I, I'd call him, and, uh, Mike, we need a 1930s car, and he, two days later, he had it. Um, and he's he, he's real good. He builds stuff. He fabricates things. Um, he's, he's everything that you could possibly want in someone to help you make low-budget films. He's hardworking, he's innovative, he's creative, and absolutely responsible. So, I mean, what more can you ask for in a, in a partner uh, for making films? Um, so, we, uh, we teamed up and we, we took a stab at it. Working with Ken McGregor. I liked Ken the first time I met him. Just a nice guy. Um, from Ypsilanti, Michigan, I believe. If if I'm, I know he's from Michigan. I believe Ypsilanti. Um, nice guy. First time I ever saw him, he's sitting in a straight jacket. Uh, I got to the shoot and uh, just excellent performer. Uh, had just page after page of uh, uh, dialogue and just hit it every word. Just, he wouldn't miss a word out of every two or three pages. He'd say, now, was that right? And just excellent. And um, just uh, uh, made working on your first movie a pleasure. Uh, just out, out on location where we're at, at the cabin. You'll see the cabin in the movie. We speak of the cabin a lot. That was a excellent old cabin. A little bit peculiar old cabin but I, we we touch on that in the commentary but it was but just excellent and true to form of a low budget film we would pull into location all of us would just start grab grabbing tripods and cameras and unloading stuff setting stuff up setting lights up ken was just right amongst us just we all just did what is like okay we're ready to shoot ken would put his jacket on straighten himself up and start hitting his lines just one right after another. He was excellent, excellent guy. Um, I'm actually hoping he's going to be down in in a few months uh, and hope to get to meet him again. And I real possibly that we will have another project going 
and uh, uh, he can work with us on it. Uh, certainly hope so anyway. Ken McGregor, uh, I actually met Ken McGregor. It's like everything, it's kind of a funny story. Um, a friend of mine was actually in a college class. This is actually before I, I started finishing up my degree. Um, this fr a friend of mine named Julie, she was taking a class on horror literature. And she had told her uh, instructor that she had a friend that had worked on a couple different horror films and kind of wanted to bring him in as a, I guess I was show and tell, I guess. And uh, he said, sure, come on. So, you know, I went down to this uh, this class and uh, talked about Mosquito and Back from Hell and working on low budget films, the, the trials and tribulations of low budget film production. And um, one of the guys in the class, you know, he just came up to me afterwards and he said, Hey man, you know, my name's Ken McGregor. I'm an actor. I live around here. If you ever want to do anything, uh, give me a call. And um, I remember I told him, Hey man, if you can take a shot of blood to the eye and then you're, <laughs> you know, you're my kind of guy. And he said, sure, give me a call. And I don't know, it was a few years after that, I was working on a film called Paladin. Uh, which is kind of a sci-fi action thing and it uh it it just sort of fell apart again i mean it's you know you hear that a lot it actually went up to i think we were on a second day of production and it just started falling apart actors had to uh, leave and money left and it just poof just evaporated man uh but i told ken much like i told mike hey man if i ever do anything i'll call you and um several years went out oh, geez i think it was seven or eight years went by and i moved to a different state and I, I hadn't talked to ken in several years and uh the you know whisper project came together and uh i called ken and i said ken hey i got this movie going man um i know you're a thousand miles away <laughs> but uh you know we i'd love for you to come down and be in it because ken ken fits the bill for low budget film production man he he is he's there you can say sunday morning at 5 a.m ken is there in costume ready to go at 4 30 a.m ken he remembers his lines you can give him anything i mean some of the dialogue in this lovecraft is it's like shakespeare man and the guy he remembers page after page after page of dialogue hits it every time doesn't drop a word um I mean, what more could you ask for? Um, from a director's standpoint, it's working with Ken and Mike. It was just a dream. I, I I didn't have to do a lot of directing with them at all. It was, uh, you know, you're this guy and this is what's going on and this is how you're supposed to feel. <laughs> and, and, you know, half the time I didn't have to do that. They, they knew what they were doing. Um, so it, it was a joy working with uh, Ken and Mike both. Um, Ken actually drove uh, from Michigan. I, I, we shot the film in Tennessee. He actually drove, no kidding, a thousand miles round trip, um, came down here and he actually slept in my son's bed, which is a tiny little bed. He slept there for a week. Um, and, and when I say we, we shot, we had him scheduled for five days. Um, we actually were done with his stuff in four days. Five days would have been a brutal shoot, but we actually got it done in four. And these days were, you know, he he just, I mean, just the fact that he'd driven 500 miles to be in the movie, but him and his wife had just had a newborn baby. So, you know, he's, he's got a, I think his son was maybe a month or two old and he comes down and spends a week with uh, Mike and I making this movie. So, I mean, you know, wh what more can you ask for? And, and again, he was, he was so prepared for everything. We got done with him a day early and, um, he went back to Michigan and it was just, it was an absolute whirlwind of of uh shooting and everything he did was right on the money what was it like playing henry ackley um i'd never of course never heard of henry ackley i ha i hadn't read that story of hp uh, lovecraft um matt Wrote the screenplay, I guess is what you'd call it. He, he took the story, The Whisperer in Darkness, and rewrote it to make a screenplay, which was pretty difficult if you've re read the book. After we started the movie, I well, I read the story, and he, he, had, to, he had to do some fancy penmanship to, to turn that into a movie. But anyway, so I start reading about 
Henry Ackley. And all we had in common was we were both old. That, that was all we had in common. So um, I, I just tried to get into some kind of character and Matt was just real good at just coaxing me along and said, just do this or do that. And, um, uh, seemed to work quite, quite well. Um, as I mentioned, it was my first attempt at ever acting. Uh, of course, I, I suppose when you get up on stage and, and do a 45 minute magic show, you're acting. Um, when you're in sports entertainment, or we like to call it wrestling, you're you're acting. Because I wasn't really a mean guy. Well, okay, that's somebody's opinion, I guess. But but anyway, but Matt just kept telling me. He said, "I, I know you got it in you. I know you can do it." He said, "Just just say it. Just say the lines." Oh, first started, I was horrible with the lines. I just stumbled through them, and Matt was like. Just say it. And I just said it. And to me, it still looks peculiar. But Matt's happy with it, and everybody else is happy with it. But I guess I am my worst critic uh, because nothing I really do uh, I like. But um, as as the movie progressed, and, and we, we almost shot it as the movie progressed, uh, I, I know most don't do it, but the actual first scene in the movie was the first scene we shot, and the last scene in the movie was the last scene we shot, and, and that's kind of the way we progressed, and uh, as you've seen the movie, um, Ackley, if I can use the term, goes downhill, you first see him in the graveyard, he's all dapper, has his suit on, he's I guess went to town or whatever, if you want to use that phrase. And uh, he, he meets a guy that he, he wants to befriend. But as as the movie goes on, and as you'll see the stress level builds, actually like goes downhill. Every time you see him, he's just a little rougher around the edges. And finally, it just kind of culminates. And um, it was... The, the one scene, uh, we, we kind of like to refer to it as the crazy Ackley. And you, you'll, you'll, you've seen it in the movie. It was the, the, the one scene where uh, Ackley's at his desk um, and, and kind of has um, a problem, I guess you might say. But that was, that was just very um, difficult scene for me to do um we it was we done it in one take we mentioned that on the commentary line uh but it was it, it just seemed it was almost like i went someplace i shouldn't have been uh how did i get started in movies well that, that's a good question man um you probably have to go back. I mean, I was always a weird kid, you know. Uh, I was the guy that, uh, you know, colored Godzilla in uh, kindergarten when I was a kid. I mean, that's I would spend, if it, if it wasn't, you know, drawing some monster, uh, I grew up watching Ultraman and Johnny Sacco and, uh, you know, the Saturday Chiller Theater. I was always into monsters. I was always, you know, into scary movies and mon more so monsters when I was a kid. Um, you know, I... I would draw things and send them into the local horror host, Sir Graves Gasly, and he'd, you know, put a picture of Godzilla or Mothra, you know. Um, and then as I got a little bit older, I remember it was, uh, I think it was right around seven or eight years old. And uh, I was looking through the, the TV guide, uh, looking for, you know, monster movie on, and I saw a movie called Night of the Living Dead that was on, and I thought that sounded absolutely terrifying. So I asked my dad, it was on at like one o'clock in the morning. I asked him if he'd sit up and, uh, uh, you know, watch this movie with me so I could, you know, if I could stay up and if he'd watch it, because obviously I would have been too terrified to watch it. And he said, sure, no problem, man. So, you know, my sister sat up, my cousin came over, we were all going to sit up. And it was like, again, one o'clock in the morning. Uh, there was some other movie on before that. And by the time Night of Living got, Night of Living Dead actually came on, 
everybody was asleep except me. All the lights are in the house. Uh, they're all off. And, you know, I'm sitting there eating this popcorn. And this movie came on, and it just floored me. I mean, it, it terrified me. But in a good way. I mean, it didn't scar me psychologically, of course. <laughs> but um, it, it was, I was blown away by it. And from that point on, I knew that I was uh, into horror films. And from then on out, I watched anything that was scary, any horror film that was on, I would watch it. Um, and then it, uh, I got interested in, uh, many years later, I saw Dawn of the Dead, the sequel to it. From then on, I knew right then I wanted to do special makeup effects. I mean, that movie was just absolutely incredible. I pursued special makeup effects for quite a while. Um, my big break, uh, my first feature film that I worked on was Back From Hell, which I made with Matt Jaisley. Uh, when I was around 17 years old, we made it on film for just nothing. Uh, shot on 16 millimeter. It's out there on DVD. You can you can watch it. Um, so we did that and kicked around, worked on that for a while. And my next big break probably came when I was working with uh, Gary Jones on Mosquito, which a lot of people have seen that. Thank goodness the uh, Sci-Fi Channel in the USA they play it all the time for a while there. It was on like every Friday night and everybody had seen that. So, you know, when you can say that you actually worked on a movie that people have seen, that, that helps, you know. Um, and I've done, geez, I don't know, it's been 12 or 13 different movies that I've worked on. Uh, Legion of the Night, um, Dead City. I worked on a bunch that will probably never get released too. But again, that's, you know, part of working in the low budget film industry. Um, worked on, uh, I think probably the latest, like, probably the the last thing i did before actually working on whisper and darkness was i actually built a uh, a full body creature suit for um for mark and john polonia for their movie splatter beach that they worked on uh which was cool that was you know meeting the polonia brothers that's you know i i have to say that if it wasn't for the polonia brothers i probably never would have got around to making this movie so if you if you don't know who the polonia brothers are you need to watch some of the movies those guys are absolute masters of low budget cinema i mean they can you know you can hand them five bucks and they'll come back two weeks later with a movie <laughs> i mean they're those guys are something else man um so yeah and it's you know i always wanted to direct i know it sounds cliche but you know i always wanted to direct i always wanted to make a movie from start to finish and you know um it was the bad part about directing a film on a really big budget is yes you're the director but so many other people work on the project and you're relying on so many other people to do so much. Um, you know, you relied on an editor to put it together, the effects guys to do this, producers got to look at it. There's all these elements that come together and there's, it's so much of it is out of your hands. And I always thought that working on low budget films, especially now with the digital technology, I mean, that's just changed everything. Nothing is the same anymore. Um, you know, when we did Back From Hell, the expense was the equipment. I mean, that was it. You know, it was twenty grand to get a film equipment, buy the film, have the film developed. You just didn't. You didn't spend any money on anything else. It was all the equipment. And now today, with the digital technology, it's completely the opposite. You know, I own all my equipment. I, we've got two cameras, two microphones, tripods, lights. We own the equipment. We pay zero on all the equipment. It's just everything else now. That's how you can make a movie for seven hundred dollars. Um, so that's that's been a godsend. Um, but you know, working in the digital medium, you can actually write the movie yourself, produce the movie yourself, shoot the movie yourself, cut the movie together yourself, do all the effects yourself, produce the DVD yourself, print the DVD, sell it yourself. I mean, Grave Hill, we own this movie from start to finish. It's been us. So, you know, succeed or fail. It's, it's our baby. Well, probably uh, the hardest part about making low budget movies is the <laughs> the effect that it has on your direct family members. Um, it's not it's not horrible, like, you know. It's not uh, dragging them off to a foreign country or something, or uh, you know, coming home drunk and beating them every night. I mean, it's not you know, it's nothing quite that bad. But uh, I mean, you literally cannot do it without the support of your family. Um, either they're in the film or helping you with the film or they just work around you. I mean, you can't, you can't imagine how 
shooting a low budget film interferes with the daily lives of the, of the people around you. I mean, it's something that you just do 724 and, and it ranges from, uh, you know, building a monster suit on the kitchen table um, to, you know, being gone for a week. I mean, when we shot Whisper in Darkness, it was literally, we would get up in the morning at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, we would load up, head on out, and we wouldn't be home till 1.30, 2 o'clock every day that we were shooting. And, you know, I mean, we have two children, and I have a responsibility in the family. And when I put that responsibility on hold for an entire week, I mean, you know, Angela picks up the slack. So my uh, my two children, I mean, they're two. My daughter, she's uh, six, and my son is nine, um, coming on 10 here. And it, you know, it doesn't really take a lot of toll on them, but... You know, I mean, you know, when I've got uh, movie stuff all over the house and I'll have to ask him if I'm shooting an interview, <laughs> you know, I have to send them down to the grandparents for two hours. So, you know, again, it's not, you know, you're not torturing your family, but it's just without their support, there's there's just no way that you could do stuff like this. I just have to thank my family. Um, you really don't know what a, what a family goes through. It's nothing horrible, but it was late nights. My wife, Debbie, she was just so understanding. Uh, don't know how many times we went in late night. and, Honey, could, could you fix us something to eat? And she'd start fixing us something to eat. Cause the rest of us would be, well, ready to eat, basically, and it'd be late at night. And just anything I needed, stuff I need to find for the movie, clothing, whatever, she was right on it. Uh, Two son, I have two sons, called on both of them numerous times. Uh, they're both in the movie. One of them is a, a body double, and one of them is a, a, a thug. He's the thug in the white shirt. That's Nathan. Um, and he, uh, the other boy is in the movie, but we won't tell you where he's at. You have to, let's say it was kind of a bit part he was in, so you'll have to find him. And, uh, Grant's my youngest son. He also uh, composed the music that's used uh, in the movie. Uh, he he makes composes music. He's made some jingles. Uh, has this just big elaborate uh, sound studio, I guess you'd call it. That that stuff still just boggles my mind. I'm just I'm just not a a comp computer type person but him and Matt sat for hours just to banging out notes and tying stuff together and making sounds and, and I definitely want to thank Grant for doing that and uh, but you, you've it's an old cliche but you've got to, if your family's behind you you got a good family behind you that, that's all it takes what's the future bringing um, we have got Grave Hill Productions. Uh, we've got a couple of ideas for movies. We've actually started um, kind of rounding up some stuff to uh, for one of the movies. Um, I don't want to divulge any, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, any of the uh, behind the scenes stuff yet because uh, something could happen at change, but. Um, we definitely uh, are going to continue making movies um, because it, it, yeah, it sounds like an old cliche, but uh, it's you people that buy our films that keeps us going that shows us that what we do is appreciated. And we're going to try, try to turn out the best low budget films we can with, with, all the resources that are available to us. Um, and we hope that when you see the name Grave Hill Productions, that you will think of a good movie. And we hope that uh, Grave Hill Productions can keep on scaring you in the future. Thank you for watching. The future of Grave Hill. Um, well, you know, Mike and I, we've, uh, we both love making movies. <laughs> so, why should we stop? Um, we've got two or three ideas for uh, you know movies right now under our, our, in the, on the back burner, I guess you might say. Um, 
we plan on uh we're actually in pre-production for the next one we've kind of got two scripts going right now we're trying to decide between uh two different scripts uh we love doing the lovecraft stuff uh, we might do another lovecraft picture uh but we're also thinking about uh maybe a zombie movie could be uh you know i'm, I'm uh, from the romero school if it wasn't for night of the living dead and dawn of the dead I, there's no way i'd be making films um so that's something we're thinking about um ultimately it's you know i mean if you want to keep watching our movies we'll keep making 